Okay, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Ted. So as Chris and Ted said, our topic today is techniques that can minimize or eliminate database corruption. As an embedded database system vendor, it's in our interest to do all that we can do to help our customers avoid this unpleasant circumstance. And I'm happy to say that after 10 years in business, no customer so far has reported an instance of database corruption with ExtremeDB that wasn't caused by faulty hardware. I mention that not just to inspire confidence in ExtremeDB, but also hopefully lend some credibility to what I'm going to be saying over the next 40 or 45 minutes. So let's start with a brief summary of what is a database. A database is any collection of related data items of various types. A database system, in contrast to a database, is the means by which that data is organized. We normally think of a database system as a complex piece of software that allows you to define the type of data you want to store, create, update, delete, and be able to search that data. The software can be a commercial program, like from Oracle or MacObject, or it can be a proprietary system that you developed in-house, in other words, a, a so-called homegrown database system. A file cabinet metaphor is often employed to explain the concepts to laypersons. So a file cabinet is a storage mechanism, and it has several drawers, and each drawer has many folders, and each folder can have many documents. So a database system is a way to define and organize a database of information, and provides a way to search it. Searching is usually anticipated in advance, and the data is organized according to those anticipated search requirements. In a file cabinet, this can be done by having uh, customers and a vendor's drawer within which the folders are uh, organized alphabetically, and then within those folders, the documents are organized by date. With the database system, the same concept is implemented by defining indexes. In either system, however, it's always possible to conduct a brute force sequential search if something isn't organized or indexed in a way that's conducive to the search requirement. And database systems are no different than file cabinets in that you can make a mess. Different database system approaches can make it easier or harder to make a mess. For example, a relational database encourages you to organize things into tables of rows and columns. On the other hand, the key value store is like the wild, wild west. There's little or no law enforcement. So what's database corruption? Well, there are several types of database corruption. First, there's what I'll call logical database corruption, and that can result when a database system doesn't enforce referential integrity or you've disabled the referential integrity, and the application deletes a record, leaving related records orphaned. For example, deleting a customer record that has one or more related invoice records is going to leave those invoice records in the database with no customer record that owns them. Another example of logical corruption would be changing the customer ID in an invoice record, which happens to be a foreign key, to the value of a customer ID to which the invoice doesn't actually belong. That's the equivalent of misfiling a paper invoice in the wrong customer folder in a file cabinet. Logical corruption can also result when the ACID properties of database transactions are either not implemented, or they're not implemented properly, or they've been disabled. In this case, it's possible to write, for example, an invoice line item record to the database, and then encounter a failure before the inventory record's quantity on hand can be decremented. That database just became logically inconsistent. It's extremely difficult to implement the enforcement of the asset properties, and a lot of homegrown databases either don't attempt it, or they just get it wrong. Next, database systems normally store exactly what you tell them to store. If, due to a defect in your application code, you pass in a nonsense value for a field, the database will happily store that nonsense value. There are exceptions, of course, such as domain dependencies in a relational database. For example, we can ensure that a compass heading is going to be between 0 and 359, and that an hour has values between 1 and 24. But something like the program title and a set-top box TV guide can be anything so the database has no ability to verify the correctness of that data before storing it. On the slide here, I've shown one way of storing garbage in a database through the ODBC API. And lastly, every database system has its own internal data structures that it uses to keep track of things. If those internal data structures get compromised, then the database system is essentially going to lose its mind, and it's going to cease to operate correctly. In layperson terms, I mean, it's going to crash. 
so far we've talked about what is a database and what is database corruption. Now, how does a database get corrupted? Well, assuming that the hardware is functioning correctly, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, there are three root causes of corrupted databases. First of all, we can't discount the possibility of a defect within the database management, self, database management system itself. A far more common cause of database corruption is errors in the application code that aren't caught during development, either by the, the developers themselves in unit testing or by the tools that they use, such as compilers and static code analyzers and so on, or during QA, again, uh, either by the QA tests or by the database runtime itself. Most of these errors can be traced back to the fact that nearly all database system programming interfaces use void pointers to pass data into the database runtime or to receive data back out of the database uh, through the database runtime. Another common problem is that the database runtime itself is not resilient against errors. Ideally, the database system should protect itself. We'll talk more about that later. Another cause is typified by the ODBC API problem that I showed a couple of slides ago. The design of the programming interface itself allows errors through bad programming practice. In this case, not freeing that statement handle in between executing different SQL statements. Finally, database systems almost universally provide no tools or capability to proactively help developers write code that use the, the database system correctly. They offer lots of tools to help tune queries, find bottlenecks in performance, and sadly, to repair corrupted databases after the fact. But as far as preventative medicine, so to speak, they got nothing. So back to the faulty hardware question. Uh, disks can and do go bad. Um, even before complete failure, they can have read and write errors. Fortunately, this is pretty uncommon compared to when I first started in the database industry back in the 80s. But more problematic is that database, uh, the, I'm sorry, some devices don't obey the rules at all, and some are overly optimized from a database vendor's perspective. In order to strictly enforce the ACID properties of transactions, and in particular the durability property, database management systems instruct the file system and the disk to flush their buffers before returning from a transaction commit. In other words, we want the file system and the device to ensure that the data we write is physically recorded on the media before we return from a transaction commit. Some devices, particularly some flash memory devices uh, with rudimentary file systems, silently ignore that command. The consequence is that the database system believes the transaction is committed and durable and recoverable when in fact it's not. Another problem is that some devices attempt to optimize writes by holding them in an on-device buffer for a period of time and grouping together writes to adjacent sectors and tracks. Now that's good in theory, and in many practical applications it is actually good, but a database system isn't one of them. Consider that most database systems employ write-ahead logging to minimize I.O. when enforcing the durability property, and, then, and also to support recovery in the event of a system failure. So in order for write-ahead logging to work as it's intended, the entries in the log file have to be written in chronological order. But consider the following scenario. The log entry for the transaction two start marker and the transaction one end marker happen to be on the same track of adjacent sectors. So the firmware decides to write those entries together before the final T1 operation. Now if we're exceedingly unlucky and the system crashes at that moment in time, then there's going to be an end of one, uh, an end of transaction marker for transaction one, but not all of one transaction one's operations actually made it into the log. They were still in the cache when the system crashed. So when the database system recovers the database from the write-ahead log on restart, the result is going to be a corrupted database. In both cases, the first case being the device silently ignoring the flush command, and the second case, the optimization that I just described. You need to read and understand the specification of your hardware. The optimization that I just described can usually be disabled through configuration settings that are applied when the system boots. This also might be an excellent reason to have a dedicated device for your database so that you can allow those optimizations uh, on a device that doesn't hold the database and disable that optimization on the device that does have the database. <clears throat> 
all software, as we know, has bugs, and complex software is more likely to have bugs. Hopefully, all database system vendors take testing and software quality seriously, but even so, bugs happen. As a case in point, I ran engineering for another embedded database vendor in the mid-90s. When I took over that role, the then current release of that software had a bug that the engineers called the exploding database bug. The database runtime would occasionally go haywire and cause the file system to report the size of the database file to be impossibly large, I mean larger than the physical size of the disk. And that bug defied all efforts to identify it or reproduce it in the QA lab. And the exploded files that were sent to us by the customers didn't reveal any forensic evidence of the cause of that bug. In the end, the next release of that database system was a major overhaul, and the bug was evidently engineered out of the system because it was never positive, positively identified, it just went away. Another case in point, the blogging site Tumblr was unavailable for about 24 hours in late 2010 because its cluster database crashed when the engineers tried to extend the storage space. The moral is, bugs happen, so be prepared for it. Database systems maintain a lot of metadata and critical runtime data structures to keep track of the state of the database system, things like active connections and transactions, key stacks, and so on. If the integrity of any of those structures is compromised, either due to corruption or faulty logic in the database runtime code itself, the database system has essentially lost its mind, and it can no longer assure the integrity of the stored data, and it just becomes a matter of time before the database is corrupted. But, as I said, database system vendors have generally done a good job of ensuring the quality of the database runtime code. Errors in application code and the database runtime's inability to defend itself against such bugs are a far more common cause of database corruption. Because application code errors and a database system's lack of defense against them is such a common source of database corruption, let's take a step back and look at three types of uh, database programming interfaces. By far, the most common uh, database programming interface is a predefined programming interface. In other words, a library of functions that you learn and use every time that you program application code that involves that database system. This applies to relational and SQL databases, as well as non-SQL databases, and to the new breed of so-called NoSQL, or not only SQL database systems. A unique approach used by McObject's ExtremeDB C language interface is to generate the programming interface as a byproduct of processing the database schema language file. Much like a C compiler processes a C source code file and produces an object code file if everything is syntactically correct, our schema compiler processes a schema file and produces a .c and a .h file if the schema is syntactically correct. As far as I know, we're the only ones that take this approach to a database programming interface. A third approach used by Object Store, our own PURST, DB4O, and ExtremeDB with its Java native and C-sharp native interfaces uh, is so-called transparent persistence, in which, to the greatest extent possible, the database system allows the developer to work with persistent objects, in other words, those objects that are destined to be stored in the database, in the same way as working with any other application object. That extends to the way in which you define the class using the host development language, such as Java. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the three approaches. As I said before, a, a library of predefined functions is the most common database system API. In the case of SQL, the de facto industry standard ODBC API serves as a good representation of a typical call level interface to SQL. For non-SQL databases, for which the APIs are sometimes called native or navigational interfaces, there is no industry standard. Every vendor exposes a proprietary API to application developers who then use that API to create open and destroy databases, insert, update, delete, and search for records, begin, and then abort transactions, and so on and so forth. These generic APIs can only work because of the concept of the void pointer, or before the NCC standard, the typecast char pointer. This slide shows how and where the void pointer is used in just one function call for each of the database products that I listed on the previous slide. Now, a major advantage of generic APIs is that once you learn it, you can apply that skill throughout your career 
every time you create a database using that vendor's database system, or in the case of ODBC, uh, for many vendors' database systems. A drawback of this approach is that a void pointer, by definition, is untyped. And that means that its validity can't be verified at compile time by the C or C++ compiler, or even at runtime by the database system. In practical terms, that means that if you set the database up to expect one type of data, and then because of a bug in your application code, you pass in a void pointer that points to a different type of data than you set the database up to expect, or if the void pointer is uh, not initialized, meaning no memory was allocated for it, or insufficient memory was allocated for it, you're going to either write garbage into the database, or you're going to cause the database to overwrite the void pointer's allocated memory and corrupt the stack or the heap. So let's look at what happens in the first case, when uh, bad arguments uh, when updating the database. Database systems usually organize the database as some number of fixed size pages. The details vary from one database system to another, but usually there's a page header that contains some meta meta data, excuse me, metadata, like whether this page is a data page or an index page. Sometimes there's a page footer, and then the majority of the page is formatted into record slots or B tree slots, as the case may be. So suppose you set the database up to expect to write a subscriber record, and, and a subscriber record is 28 bytes long. If the void pointer that the application passes in through the database API doesn't actually dereference to a subscriber record, for example, if it dereferences to a quality of service record and a quality of service record is only 20 bytes long, then the database runtime is going to write 20 bytes of quality of service data into the first 20 slot bytes of a slot for a subscriber record, and then 8 bytes of random value from either the stack or the heap into the last 8 bytes of the subscriber record. Now, that doesn't compromise the structural integrity of the database. In other words, the database vendor's tools to check the integrity of the database would not report any corruption. But nevertheless, the database is obviously corrupt at this point. Database APIs that pass in a size parameter, such as C-Tree and Berkeley DB, are potentially more dangerous. If we intend to update uh, an existing record on a page that has a certain size, and we tell the database system through that size argument to write more bytes than the size of that record at that location, the database is going to overwrite the beginning of the next slot. If the slot happens to be the last slot on the page, this could overwrite the database system's page footer and or the page header for the next page. And now we have both structural corruption and data corruption. We're seeing yet some non-relational database systems, in particular network model databases, object-oriented databases, and graph database systems, also sometimes embed database metadata at the beginning of every slot which amplifies the potential for corruption because now overwriting any slot, not just the last slot on a page, is going to overwrite critical structural data. Void pointers are also dangerous when we're reading data from the database into application variables. Here, any number of things can go wrong. If the variable that the database is going to read into was declared on the stack and it's not large enough to receive the data from the database, then stack overflow is going to result, followed by a crashed application. If the variable was a pointer and we either A, forgot to allocate memory for it, or B, we didn't allocate sufficient memory for it, then the database is either going to overwrite the allocated memory uh, and then therefore corrupt the heap's metadata, which is eventually going to lead to a crash, although that crash might happen long after the offending code, or the database is going to write to a random location in memory if the pointer was uninitialized, which may or may not lead to a segmentation fault. Or the database is going to try to write to address zero, uh, which will definitely induce a segmentation fault. In the case of an uninitialized pointer, it's going to have a random value, which translates to a random address in memory. So if you're really unlucky, that random address is going to be a valid address somewhere within the process's address space. And then you're going to get really strange and really difficult to debug results. Where still, that random address could be in the database system's cache or some other database metadata, leading to either a very difficult to diagnose corrupted database or seemingly random unrecoverable errors from the database system. In other words, if that address happens to be in the cache, you're going to scribble random data into the cache. Eventually, those cache pages will be flushed out to the disk, and now you've got a corrupted database. Or if that random address 
uh, points into the database's metadata, then it's going to corrupt that metadata, and the next time the database system tries to use that metadata, the database system is going to crash. And because the crash is in the database runtime code, you're probably going to blame the database vendor. So embedded, say, uh, embedded database systems would be safer if they didn't use void pointers uh, to exchange data between the database runtime and the application. And the way to achieve that is to reject the idea of a generic predefined program, programming interface that uses void pointers. And that's what MacObject did in creating its Extreme DB embedded database. Now the requir requirement when using this approach is that the database cannot be schemaless. So a simple key value store like uh, Berkeley DB or Redis or RIAC or others are out. A schema language is required. Now this could be SQL, but embedded database systems, and especially those for embedded systems, often don't need SQL or they can't afford the required processing power of SQL. So for ExtremeDB, it didn't make sense to use SQL as the data definition language, but then not for the data manipulation language. Nevertheless, we wanted a language that would be familiar to developers in order to minimize the learning curve. So we made ExtremeDB's schema language very C++-like. If you know how to define a C++ class, you already know most of the ExtremeDB schema language. Your schema is processed by a schema compiler, which produces .c and .h files. The .h file contains function prototypes for the programming interface that you'll use in your application code to create, read, update, and destroy objects in the database. In other words, the so-called CRUD operations. The .c file contains the database dictionary and the impl implementation of the functions that are prototyped in the .h file. The database dictionary is a binary form of the C++-like database schema that you just defined, and the database runtime uses it to know how to lay objects out in memory, what fields participate in what indexes, uh, about event notifications, and so on. So let's look at an example here. On the left is a simple one-class database definition. The, and in ExtremeDB, a class is analogous to a table in a relational database. But whereas a relational table is two-dimensional, consisting of rows and columns, an ExtremeDB class can be arbitrarily complex. In our example, we have a structure called DateTime that we then use as a field in our class, along with some other scalar fields and then a couple of index definitions. When we run this schema through the schema compiler, the function prototypes on the right are generated in the .h file. So notice that there are no void pointers. The function measurement new expects a handle to a measurement object, and the function measurement key put expects a handle to a measurement object and a four byte unsigned integer. So it's a type safe programming interface. We can't pass bad arguments into this API. We can't accident accidentally pass a probe handle to a function that expects a measurement handle. The C compiler simply won't compile that code. So we're going to catch and fix that error very early in the development cycle. Whereas if we'd used void pointers, we wouldn't, the, the compiler wouldn't catch that error at all, and the database runtime wouldn't catch that error. We'd have to find it much later in the development cycle in our unit testing or our QA, or worse yet, our customer finds it for us when we deploy that object into the field. So while this uh, approach is unique in the database world, as far as I know, it's not unique in the larger programming world. So while I was describing this approach to the Extreme DB programming interface, some of you might have been thinking, hey, that sounds like the CORBA IDL. And it is. Uh, IDL, incidentally, uh, stands for Interface Definition Language. And the approach is very much the same. Another way to avoid the use of void pointers is to use a programming language that doesn't use void pointers, uh, or use object-oriented principles uh, in the creation of a database programming interface. Our own PURST, which has pure Java and C Sharp implementations, is representative of this approach, uh, as are the database systems on the previous slide, DB4O and Object Store. Um, and again, ExtremeDB with its Java native interface and C Sharp native interfaces are also representative. So in these, we use the language itself to define the classes of objects to be stored in the database. Uh, and at runtime, we exploit language features specifically reflection, to discover the classes and their attributes, and then we build that database dictionary on the fly at runtime. 
object-oriented databases that use C++, which still has void pointers, may or may not be better with, the, with respect to database corruption due to misuse of the API. You'd have to look at the particular API of each of those uh, object-oriented databases to make that determination on your own. Well, TypeSafe type API is a great first line of defense against database corruption, but because ExtremeDB was written explicitly for embedded systems and embedded systems just shouldn't fail, we needed to go further and focused on the possible sources of corruption beyond the database API. As I explained earlier, things can go wrong that compromise the integrity of critical runtime data structures in the database runtime, which then cause the runtime to have a fatal error. To help guard against this, we can take a multifaceted approach. First, we can perform some checking within the database runtime that the application code is using the database runtime in the way that we intended it to be used, and that those critical runtime structures haven't been compromised. For example, we can check that an object handle is being used within the scope of the transaction, and that uh, the, uh, the transaction handle itself is valid. In other words, that the associated transaction hasn't already been committed or aborted. If a problem is then detected, we can call an error handler, and you can set a breakpoint in that error handler so that you can uh, look at the call stack and diagnose and repair the application logic. But all that che uh, checking takes CPU cycles. So we deliver two sets of libraries with the, de uh, the database development kit, a debug library and a release library. The debug library checks much more extensively than the release library does uh, in the manners that I just described. The assumption is that you'll use the debug library during development, unit testing, and QA, and then you'll link with the release library when your system has passed all the tests and the QA to get faster runtime performance. The hash define Mako config check level in the ExtremeDB source code determines how much runtime checking is done. Our object code licensees get two versions of the library, the debug library with the highest level of check level and the release library with the lowest level and then source code customers can build versions of the libraries that are in between the highest and the lowest levels. ExtremeDB also keeps track of a transaction's state. If a database error occurs, it changes the transaction state to an error state, and then any subsequent attempt to work with the database through that transaction handle just immediately returns. In other words, the first thing any ExtremeDB runtime function does is check the transaction state. If the transaction is already in an error state, then the function is just going to immediately return control to your application code. A cause of database corruption and crashes is applications that fail to check the return codes and continue to try to use the database even after it's reported an error. You know, it's roughly analogous to hearing a funny noise in your engine, but you keep on driving. Eventually, worse things are going to happen. So by checking the transaction state before uh, continuing to use the uh, or allow the code to execute through the database runtime, uh, we prevent that type of thing from happening. For in memory databases on systems that support it, ExtremeDB can write protect the database memory. So when the call stack enters the database runtime, in other words, you call an ExtremeDB function, then the write protection is disabled so that the, the database runtime can modify the in memory database. And then before the database runtime returns control of the application, that write protection is re-enabled. So any attempt to modify the database memory outside of the extreme DB runtime is going to cause a segmentation fault. And finally, with extreme DB, you can choose to enable an option to calculate a CRC value for every page of a database. So if the database is modified in any way other than through the database programming interface, for example, you have a loose pointer that scribbles random data into the database cache, and that cache gets flushed out to the disk, that CRC check is going to fail. So any of us that have spent days or weeks chasing down an elusive bug probably don't need to be sold on the importance of the issues that we've been discussing. But let's zoom out to the big picture and look at some research on the cost of software defects. And then after that, we'll use that to put a value on some of the techniques that we've talked about. The U.S. Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, uh, states that software defects cost the U.S. economy nearly $60 billion a year, and that catching defects earlier in the development would cut that to $22.2 billion. That's a reduction of more than half. 
And that same study reports that 80% of development time is spent identifying and correcting defects. In other words, we spend 20% of our time creating defects and 80% of our time fixing those defects. A paper by the late Watts Humphrey, who was the founder of the Software, Engin Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University and the creator of the Capability Maturity Model, examined the results of studies at IBM and TRW on the relative cost of correcting defects at various stages in the development cycle. The values on the X or Y axis rather reflect multiples of one unit of time required to correct a defect. Now the final data point on the TRW study was actually a range of 70 units of time to 1,000 units of time. I used the value of 200 rather than the worst case value of 1,000 in order, to, in order to keep this graph on a reasonable scale. But the chart illustrates the tremendous advantage of not using void pointers, which allows us to find defects as early as possible in the development cycle. So to put a, minor, a finer point on it, Mr. Humphrey went on to report that the time to find and correct each defect during the test stage ranges from 2 to 20 hours. So if we assume a payroll cost of $100,000 for a senior programmer, then each defect found during test has a cost of $96 to $960 compared to a cost of $160 to $3,200 to find that defect in the field. Mr. Humphrey also asserted that historically, senior programmers insert 100 defects per 1,000 lines of code and that half of those are found by the compiler. So from that data, if we assume that an application has 35,000 lines of code and that 10,000 lines are related to database operations and the database API uses void pointers, then we can assume that half the defects will remain after compilation or 500 defects. Again, 10,000 lines of code uh, is going to have 1,000 uh, defects and half of those are going to be found by the, comp by the compiler, so we've got 500 defects left after compilation. So the implied cost to correct those 500 defects during test ranges from $48,000 to $1.6 million. Those numbers are derived by multiplying the best case uh, cost per defect after compilation of $96 by 500 defects, which gets you to $48,000, and the worst case cost, which was $3,200 times 500 defects, which gets you to $1.6 million. However, our database API doesn't use void pointers, the ExtremeDB API doesn't use void pointers, and, and thereby further exploits the compiler's ability to find defects, so we can reduce costs by finding more errors early in the development cycle. So if we conservatively estimate just 10% fewer defects, then the savings ranges from $4,800 to $160,000. So you can plug in your own numbers for the lines of code in your system and how many of those lines of code are related to database operations, and your own estimate for how many defects might be caught earlier in the development cycle by any combination of not using void pointers, having a debug library, memory protection, CRC checksums, and so on, to catch errors prior to test or during test rather than in the field. Now, even if you're not using and you don't plan to use ExtremeDB, you can apply at least some of these techniques on your own. For example, you can create your own type safe API to the database, which is commonly called a database abstraction layer, so that your application code avoids the use of void pointers. You can even create your own version of something like the ExtremeDB schema compiler that generates uh, such an interface for you and optionally also generates the SQL create table statements, so your application's database interface and the database definition will then always evolve in lockstep. And you can implement that approach for a homegrown database, for a commercial database, for an open source uh, key value pair database, or even a database system that already has its own data definition language, but that doesn't have a type safe API. You can also wrap this concept of uh, uh, checking the uh, state of a transaction up in this abstraction layer. So you can have your own notion of a, a transaction handle within your abstraction layer and you can carry along with that transaction handle the state of that transaction and do your error checking uh, within that abstraction layer. And just like we do with the Extreme DB API, that is abstraction layer can just immediately return if that transaction uh, is already in an error state. So a lot of these techniques that I've talked about uh, 
can be implemented by you, um, although some of them, you know, unless you have access to the database runtime code, can't, such as the memory protection and the CRC checking. So wrapping up here, we talked about the root causes of database corruption, those being uh, defects within the database runtime itself. Hopefully those are few and far between. Uh, bugs in the application code, which uh, could be because of uh, improper use of void pointers that are used in the database uh, programming interface, or just having a loose pointer in your application that's scribbling random data into the uh, uh, over the database runtime's metadata or the cache pages. Um, and then lack of defense in the database system against those types of errors. We talked about three different approaches to database programming interfaces that are commonly used. The predefined generic API that exploits void pointers, which is a wonderfully uh, flexible programming interface, uh, but carries a whole set of problems uh, with respect to improper use of those APIs. We talked about uh, API that's derived from your schema, which is the technique that we employ, and then using object-oriented interfaces that simply don't uh, have void pointers, or object-oriented languages, rather. Um, and we talked about the, the specific problems associated with void pointers, you know, corrupting, corrupting the, the stack or the heap, corrupting the database, probably both, and ultimately leading to a, a crashed application as well. And we talked about uh, how expensive these bugs are and how by employing techniques to find these defects earlier in the process, uh, we can dramatically reduce the expense associated with those defects. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ted to uh, moderate some questions and answers. Okay, thanks, Steve. And uh, like you said, I'd now like to take questions from the audience. You can submit questions uh, using the Q&A box on the lower right corner of your screen. I'll wait a moment for any questions to come in. You describe corruption from storage devices in a scenario involving write-ahead logging. If I'm not using transaction logging, does my hardware present any risk of data corruption? Um, the, the short answer is uh, yes. Um, first of all, if you're not using transaction logging, you're putting yourself at greater risk of database corruption regardless. Uh, but uh, it's also the case that uh, inexpensive uh, flash memory devices with rudimentary file systems can actually be uh, rendered useless by uh, a power failure at an inopportune time. Um, now, you can use a transactional file system. That's going to afford you an extra measure of protection against that. Um, and it's also the case that write-ahead logging is not the only kind of logging. Uh, for example, ExtremeDB uh, also offers redo logging, uh, and we're not the only vendor that offers uh, redo logging. And then PURST doesn't do logging per se at all, but uses uh, shadow pages and a bitmap to toggle between isolated and not, not isolated pages uh, during a transaction commit. Uh, another question that's come in is, do you like Microsoft Access? Um, well, I, I neither like nor dislike Microsoft Access. Um, it's... Uh, had a, uh, a reputation of not uh, performing well at scale when the database gets very large. And uh, as I recall, uh, its granularity for concurrent access is, is fairly uh, uh, coarse, so it also won't scale in terms of multi-user concurrency, but uh, uh, it's certainly a popular database. Uh, more questions from anyone? And one that's come in is, uh, are object database systems in Java and C Sharp type safe? Uh, as a result, is database corruption much less common when using them or when programming in these languages? Um, well, Java and C Sharp are type safe. They don't have the concept of a void pointer. Um, so they do eliminate that uh, particular cause of database corruption. Uh, but a database system should still have measures to protect itself, and an object-oriented language doesn't prevent things like overflow and underflow uh, that can lead to bad data. So uh, they're certainly a step in the right direction, but they're not a, a panacea for uh, uh, eliminating database corruption. Uh, 
does ExtremeDB provide any utilities to automatically check for corruption and repair it? At runtime, yes. So you know, I described that debug version. Uh, you know, ExtremeDB has a lot of checks for uh, the integrity of the system. Um, so much so that the assumption is that when your application passes all of its unit testing and QA with the debug library, then you can relink your application with the release library and be confident that there are no database corruption causing defects in your application. And again, that's been borne out by uh, our 10 years of experience of not having any corrupted databases uh, in the field that weren't a, a fault of the uh, underlying hardware. Um, so we don't have a utility to check the integrity of a database. Um, uh, we don't have a standalone utility for that. You know, that's built into the library. We don't have a standalone utility for that, or to repair a corrupted database because there's never been any need. More questions, please. You can submit them in the Q and A window on your screen. Is corruption more likely to occur with large databases as opposed to small databases? Uh, no, actually, um, it's it can happen with a small or a large database. Um, the one thing I would say is that you need to uh, test your database system against boundary conditions. Uh, for example, uh, you know, its maximums, uh, the maximum number of rows in a table, maximum number of slots in an index, uh, the maximum aggregate size of the database if there is one, uh, what happens when the disk is full, what happens when the system runs out of memory, uh, is the database system going to be well behaved uh, in all these different circumstances? So test the boundaries of your uh, of your database system. Is data corruption less of a risk with an in-memory database? Uh, no, I would say, in fact, it's more of a risk for an in-memory database, uh, particularly for an embedded in-memory database. Um, so when I say embedded, I mean the, uh, the database runtime is given to you as a set of libraries, and you link those libraries into your application so that the database functionality is embedded within uh, your own application. And in the case of an in-memory embedded database, the memory for the database is also within your application's address space, which makes it susceptible to problems like what we talked about today with uninitialized pointers, uh, pointers which you didn't allocate enough memory for, uh, and so on. Um, in other words, these, uh, these kinds of problems can cause random data to be scribbled over either the database runtime structures or the database memory itself. Um, now, a client-server in-memory database, in contrast to an embedded database, uh, there's a separate database server, and the in-memory database is maintained within the address space of that separate database server. So in that case, a client program can't scribble random data over the in-memory database because it's in a different process's address space, and the operating system itself will prevent that from happening. So you get a measure of protection by using a client-server in-memory database relative to uh, uh, an embedded uh, in-memory database. Uh, however, you pay a pretty big price for that, which is the cost of the inter-process communication between the client and the server. So you're giving back a lot of the performance advantage of having an in-memory database by incurring the cost of that inter-process communication. It's also the case that, at least with ExtremeDB, with its ability to turn on memory protection, uh, that advantage that a client-server in-memory database has over other in-memory embedded databases uh, is taken away. You know, we have this, uh, we're able to protect that memory. So there is no particular advantage to having a client server architecture in that case. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? We do have time for, for one or two more. Uh, one question is, I've heard about database corruption occurring due to a power outage or from switching off or rebooting while the application is in use. Can the ExtremeDB features discussed today prevent this corruption? Well, corruption because of power failure or a three-finger reboot or whatever the case might be uh, is usually because transactions are not being used. Um, either they uh, weren't implemented at all in a homegrown database or they were implemented incorrectly or in the case of a commercial database, the application intentionally turned off one or more transaction properties. Um, if the asset properties are being uh, properly enforced and the hardware is operating correctly, 
then power failure or uh, an unexpected termination of a program shouldn't cause database corruption. All right. Well, thanks, Steve. Uh, and it looks like we've come to the end of our webinar today. But for any more questions that we haven't answered, we'd be happy to respond to you by email. Just contact us at the email address uh, given on the screen. Also, we will post a recorded version of this presentation to McObject's website. We want to thank you for attending the webinar today. We hope you've gained a good understanding of how data becomes corrupted, whether through faulty hardware settings, database runtime defects, APIs that enable data typing errors, and or lack of diagnostics in the database runtime. As you've seen, developers can take steps that reduce or eliminate these risks, preventing costly damage. We will be holding follow-on sessions in the upcoming weeks and look forward to you joining us then. Thank you and good day. <laughs>